All right, so welcome everybody to the um, International ADN Seminar Series. I'm Erin Hicks at the University of Alaska Anchorage. I'm one of the co-coordinators for the seminar series and it's with great pleasure that I uh, have the opportunity to introduce Miguel Perez Andrea from the Observatorio Astronomico Nacional, um, where he's a permanent staff astronomer. And so um, Miguel is an expert in and high spatial resolution observations, both in, in local uh, galaxies, but also those at higher redshifts. And he works across um, many wavelengths, so optical to, and infrared to millimeter and radio. He received his PhD at the Universidad Autonoma de Madrid. Um, and then he went on to hold a number of prestigious postdocs and fellowships in multiple countries, including the International Herschel Fellowship, which he held in, in Italy. Um, and at the University of Oxford, where he was a postdoctoral research associate, he was also the Harmony um, Project scientist. And then he also was awarded the Atraccion de Talento Investigador Senior Fellowship, um, which he held in Spain. Um, he's done a lot of uh, really great work in investigating ULERGs and AGN, and he's involved in a number of collaborations that I um, was really impressed at your, your CV that you shared, Miguel, and the number of different projects you're involved in, um, one being the, the GATOS collaboration, which is where I've had the pleasure of getting to, to work with Miguel. Um, and then in addition to his very productive research, he's also been involved in a number of instrument development teams. So he was involved with SPICA, the ELT Harmony, as I mentioned, as well as JWST Miri. Um, and to also mention that he is the, the main developer, I found this particularly impressive, Miguel, the main developer for the open source Harmony um, Science Simulator, which is a, a tool that's been used for an impressive number of 20 plus um, publications already. So um, a, a very useful um, contribution to many people's work. And so today, um, Miguel will be sharing with us JWST Miri MRS view of the JET ISM interaction in NGC 7319 and the question of missing JET energy. So I'll hand it over to you, Miguel. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I will share the screen. Um, now it should be working. Okay. Yep, looks good. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this seminar. So in this talk, I will present some of the results we obtained from this uh, meeting infrared or AWST meeting infrared observation of this galaxy and this is 7319. And in particular, I will talk about the interaction of the jet from the AGN of this galaxy and interstellar medium in the nuclear region of this object. So I imagine uh, you are familiar, many of you are very familiar with this image. So this is part of the GWST early release observations. This was released uh, last July. And this one shows the Stefan Quintet that are these uh, five galaxies that are labeled here. I cross out this one because this is actually a galaxy of much lower resistance. But so this is a foreground galaxy that we see in projection uh, in this uh, the region with this in, uh, interact, in this background interacting group. So this is not physically connected to the interacting group, so we, I will ignore this galaxy in the following. This image was obtained uh, uh, combining some near count filters between the micron and 4.4 micron and some also some weird filters. So the near count filters uh, basically uh, trace the emission from the stars, that is this emission that is seen in white colors in this uh, image. And also the, the MIRI filters, this is the 7.7 uh, micron filter, which traces the pH emission. You can see this pH emission here, here, and also in this region that is known as the soft, as the soft front, that we uh, mention also later. Uh, the pH emission is typically uh, connected to a star formation, but this is possibly a star formation that is triggered by the interaction. Also the 10 micron uh, filter of MIRI traces uh, warm dust and also molecular gas, but it's also quite bright at these uh, soft regions and also in these uh, regions close to the, to the main galaxy in the region. So in addition, it was observed with NISPEC, uh, the main galaxy. I will not talk about the NISPEC uh, data in, in this presentation. So I will focus on this uh, mini uh, resolution spectroscopy data 
uh, and that will be the, the focus of, of this talk. So, well, so this uh, Stefan Quinta, this is an interacting group that is located at a distance of about uh, 90 megaparsecs. In reality, there is a fifth galaxy at the same resi that is covered by the JWST field of view, but it's also part of this uh, interaction, interaction group. So I think it's useful to solve uh, this cartoon to describe the, the, well, what we see in, in this interaction. So we have the main galaxy here, this NGC 7319. This is the more, the more massive galaxy in the group. Uh, it's also classified as a CIFR2, so it has an, an ABN. And well, this interaction began about a few hundred mega years ago uh, with interaction with this galaxy, the 7320C, that is known as the first collider. And this interaction produced this outer tail that uh, currently is quite uh, faint and hard to detect. Then the second phase of interaction more recently, there was this galaxy here, and this is 7318A, that is the second collider, that is thought to produce this inner tail. And then later, there is another galaxy, this 7318B, this galaxy here, that is known as the high speed intruder. And this is because its velocity resid is like a thousand kilometers lower than the, than the resid of the group. And it's thought that this uh, high speed intruder is the one that is responsible for this uh, shock front that we saw before in the PAH emission and also with the, the uh, uh, in front of the, this uh, emission of the conduct. And this region is also quite bright in its rays and also uh, with molecular uh, emission from uh, H2. And this last interaction is, is also responsible for this north, west, and south, west stellar phase. Finally, there is a, a fifth a galaxy in the group, this uh, 7317, that is not interacting yet with the main galaxy, but it's possible that in the future it also uh, participate in this interaction. So, well, so galaxy mergers and interactions are uh, very important in the current cosmological model, this hierarchical lambda CDN, and they are needed to explain the formation and evolution of galaxies. So according to simulations, it's thought that massive galaxies build up their stellar mass with galaxy mergers, and also based on observations and simulation, uh, we know that interactions can create strong starbursts and also AGN, and that these starbursts and AGN seems to be self-regulated by some feedback mechanisms that I will briefly describe uh, later. And also these interactions are quite important because they are uh, one of the ways that are thought to uh, transform spiral galaxies into passive galaxies. And here, I also wanted to show this animation. This is from the Horizon AGN cosmological simulation. And this tracks the evolution of this galaxy between Recipe 3.2 and 1.8. So this is close to the peak of the star formation of the universe. And as you can see, these galaxies constantly interacting with smaller galaxies that is similar to what we see in the Stefan Quintet. So studying these local uh, interacting groups is also useful to understand what happened at these uh, high resistance interactions close to the peak of the, of the star formation of the universe. Um, well, as I said before, the star formation and its end uh, are regulated by some feedback uh, processes. And in this talk, I will uh, mostly describe the, the AGN feedback. So, well, AGM feedback uh, can be uh, classified into mode, the relative mode, and the radio mode, also known as yet or kinetic mode. So, in the relative mode, uh, this uh, happens when the black hole can or uh, uh, creates material in an efficient way. Uh, so, the luminosity of these AGMs are higher than 1% of the eventual luminosity. And this happens in galaxies with a large amount of dust and gas in the neutral regions, for example, spiral galaxies or also interacting, interacting systems. And in some cases, uh, there are radio jet, uh, that is have like radio loud uh, AGNs, and but also in some cases, there are no radio emissions, so they are known as uh, radio quiet. And this uh, relative mode is identified as super galaxies in the local universe or quasar, but that can be type one or type two, depending on the orientation. Then there is another uh, mode of AGM feedback, that, uh, this radio mode, that this is when the um, black hole is not accreting material in efficient, uh, efficiently. So the luminosity is less than 1% of the eventual luminosity, but instead they can produce a strong uh, and bright radio jet. And this kind of uh, feedback is more uh, or in, the, in the feedback that is dominant in elliptical galaxies and in passive galaxies 
that when they have two gas in the, in the central region, so this is the, the mode that they dominate in these uh, galaxies. So the feedback effect or the effects of this feedback can classify as negative feedback, it produces a self-regulation of the AGM and its transformation. And it's thought that the radiative feedback is responsible for the migration from the blue main sequence of the star forming galaxies to the red sequence. And also this radiative mode uh, is thought to be responsible or, or set up this relation between the black hole mass and the gold uh, properties. While this radio jet, that is the um, this radio jet mode that is uh, present in, in passive galaxies, it seems to be uh, responsible for preventing the star formation of um, on these elliptical galaxies and uh, keeping them, them as red uh, galaxies by heating the gas in the, in the nuclear region and the stress in the stellar medium uh, by keeping the gas and preventing the collapse of the, of the clouds and the formation of the stars. There are also some uh, positive feedback processes, but in general, the, the dominant feedback is this kind of negative, uh, negative mode. Although I will also mention this positive feedback, for example, star formation that is induced by the radio jets. Um, because in this galaxy it was proposed that there was an evidence of positive feedback, but I will, as we will see later, maybe it's not the case. So I, I also, before I, I start with the, the new observations, I think it's important to, to show some of key aspects of these galaxies because they are uh, needed to interpret the, the media observations. So here I show uh, the NIRCAM uh, image. So this is basically the emission from the stars. As you can see, there is a large scale bar with two spiral arms at the tip of the bar. Uh, this galaxy, the activity of the, uh, the nuclear activity of this galaxy is classified as a circuit 2 from optical spectroscopy. This was observed uh, with PIMAS at a relatively low spectral resolution. Uh, it was possible to obtain this DPT or 2D uh, DPT uh, diagram. So most of the emission uh, close to the center is classified as AGN. There are uh, this red in this diagram. The green regions are composite, uh, uh, composite excitation is possibly due to shocks. And also there are some, uh, well, some small, smaller regions or, uh, that is, uh, seems to have um, a Starburst uh, excitation. In terms of luminosity, this is the hard X-ray luminosity. It's to the 44 Hz per second. Which is similar to a, well, a normal uh, supergalaxy in the local universe. The column density of during this uh, luminosity is uh, 10 to the 24 uh, particles per centimeter square, which is uh, compatible with the Cipher 2 classification of this galaxy. Then this galaxy has a radio jet. This is a low power uh, radio jet. It is uh, a power similar to, in, to the one in the in, in N68. Uh, the radio emission at 1.4 gigahertz is represented in this image with the, these uh, contours here. The background is an HST UV image. And if we focus on the radio, so we have a compact uh, radio core that is uh, the AGN. And also there are two asymmetric radio hotspots that is uh, to the north that is closer, it's only 400 passes away, and the one to the south that is located 1.5 kiloparsec. And also we can see some diffuse radio emission close to the hot spot is that in these radio lobes from the radio jet. Uh, and that we uh, name this as these M1 and S1 regions. So, well, as I mentioned before, uh, in this region here, in one, we have a UV emission, and also this is an H alpha emission from HST with an arrow band filter. And in this region, we have UV and H alpha that this, uh, it was proposed that it was uh, produced by John Starr. So this could be an evidence of positive feedback. It is in the produced by the jet that is compressing the, the gas. So we have uh, John Starr here producing this mission. But as we will see later, maybe uh, well, possibly it's not the, this is not produced by John Starr. Um, this galaxy also has an ionized outflow. And this is the, the PMAS, the interactive spectroscopy data. This is the H alpha map. And this is the, the H alpha and the two nitrogens. The, even the resolution is not uh, very high, but it's possible to see that the peak of the H alpha is blue shifted. So this uh, blue shifted outflow with velocities about 300, 500 kilometers is detected uh, to the north of the nucleus. If we now uh, look at the high resolution image from HST, this is the H alpha that is now resolved at a much higher resolution because the PMAS is very low resolution, it's almost three half seconds per fiber. So if we resolve this emission, we see that the H alpha has many arcs and bow shocks. So this H alpha emission is possibly 
uh, related to the to the jet that is also following these, these axes. The, there is another paper where they present the gas and the ionized gas in stellar kinematics in this galaxy. So as I said, the, 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 the outflow is also detected in the oxygen three, and this is the kinematics of the oxygen three. We can see that the, the emission to the south is blue shifted, so it's similar to what we see in H alpha, and to the north is seems also a bit blue shifted with respect to the, to the zero velocity, but it's less less than the T So there is a velocity gradient that is uh, coincident with this with the axis of the jet. So possibly this O3 emission is uh, related, or all the O3 emission that we see is possibly related to the, to the jet and the activity and to this uh, outflow that we see in the in Chalfa and the ions gas. Then the kinematic of the stars is completely different. Here we have the shifted emission to the west and to um, blue city to the, to the east. So we can trace a kinematic axis, possibly, um, and we define some disk. Uh, rotation in the central part. So if we now take the large scale image uh, of this galaxy, so this is the bar and there are two, two spider arms. If we assume that these spider arms are failing, that is what we observe typically in, in local galaxies, uh, that means uh, that the rotation of this pattern is counted clockwise in the, in the sky. So this assumption, this duration of the rotation together with the, with the kinematic axis and the velocity field, the velocity field and velocity field, can be used to determine what is the far side uh, and the near side of the disk in our line of sight. And um, this is useful because we want to, to estimate the relative orientation of the jet and the disk and to see, uh, to try to, to understand why this, uh, there is this asymmetry in the radio hospitals. So uh, there's a high uh, uh, asymmetry in this uh, in this hotspot is uh, 400 parsecs and 1.5. So this is uh, quite high compared to the asymmetry that is observed in other uh, radio jets. One possibility is a uh, relativistic beaming. In this case, the approach inside is brighter and also is seen more distance. But in this case, in this galaxy, the approach inside is this one to the south that is, uh, is, what is fainter and also is farther from the center. So this what we see in this galaxy is the opposite to what we expect in this case of relativistic beam. Instead, another option is that there is an uh, interaction of the jet uh, with the interstellar medium. This is a low uh, power radio jet. So in this case, is uh, according to simulation, it seems that the radio jet can is able to transfer a significant fraction of its energy to the interstellar, interstellar medium. So it can interstellar medium can decelerate the, the jet. And this is also supported by the presence of some uh, dust lanes to the north that, uh, that are coincident with this uh, hotspot here, the M2 that is seen in the Chalfa, it, it located here between these two dust lanes. And if we put together all this information, uh, we can have the or we can have uh, an explain with this cartoon here. So we are observing the galaxy from this uh, in this direction. We have the AGM here with the disk uh, with this orientation with the far side to the north. Uh, we have the the jet that is uh, interacting here closer to the AGM with some dust lanes that are that we see here. But then to the south, uh, apparently, is uh, the, there is no material in the in the direction of the jet. So this is interacting here with some atomic dust. And then the outflow is also consistent, or the velocity that we see received and received is consistent with an outflow in the disk uh, on, in the disk on, or located uh, or find in the in the disk of the stars, which is what is expected in this kind of uh, radio uh, jet to produce uh, outflows. So uh, well another property of this galaxy is uh, that because of the interaction uh, most of the gas that was in the interstellar medium of this galaxy is already uh, in the intergalactic medium. So, it, uh, according to some simulations, all this material that is in the soft front uh, was before or one part of the ISM of 7319, but because of the two interactions with two other galaxies, it's already here. Then, another uh, well, characteristic of this galaxy is that the CO emission, which is a ferrometric, low resolution ferrometric uh, CO data. We see that most of the CO emission is in at this, at this complex uh, to the north, 
and the emission that we see here uh, close to the AGN is relatively faint. So this is also different from uh, other galaxies or isolated galaxies. So now uh, I will describe the, the MNS data. So this galaxy was observed with the four uh, with the four MNS channels between 4.9 micron and 28 micron. Uh, this was observed with a single pointing. That means that the field of view varies between 3.5 a second and 7 a second. This is represented here. So the background image is from the long wavelength channel, so we can cover a, a larger area. While the, the shorter wavelength channels, channel one and channel two, only cover this inner part. So for, for the southern uh, hotspot, we only cover uh, we only cover a fraction of the emission lines, and also the resolution, the spatial resolution is lower because it's a longer wavelength. In terms of spectral resolution, uh, it is between 80 and 130 kilometers per second, depending on wavelength. This corresponds to our 2013 to 3700. And here I saw an example of the, of the spectra that we can obtain from this uh, data cube. This, this is the AGN spectrum. And I highlight here some of the features we have in the spectrum. So we have <clears throat> this uh, 9.7 micron absorption. This is the silicate uh, feature. Uh, at 11.3, there is some pH emission, which in this galaxy is extremely faint, which is, uh, so this feature is bright in star in Starbucks galaxies. So it's detected in, in the AGM, but it's extremely faint. So it is consistent with the non-detection of the Starbucks activity or Starbucks classification based on the optical uh, data in this galaxy. Also, uh, there are a number of, of uh, hydrogen recombination lines, the Hun uh, series and the Humphrey series. And also there are some, uh, well, there are many atomic uh, lines from low ionization, like uh, argon-2, argon-2, to uh, coronal lines, like magnesium-5, minus 6. And I also wanted to highlight here that there are many, uh, there a series of neon, line, uh, neon lines, from neon-2, neon-3, neon-5, and neon-6, with uh, increasing ionization potential. So it's possible to trace the ionization state of the gas uh, for using the same uh, atoms. So it's not dependent on the abundance of the, of the, of the gas, uh, the relative abundance of the elements uh, that is in the gas. So uh, what we did with these uh, data cubes is uh, we created some uh, line maps and started the spectra from some regions. Uh, this uh, figure here shows the, the spectra of two regions, the AGN, this one here, and the, and the north uh, radio hotspot, the N2. So this region here and this region here. So this is only the short uh, wavelength uh, spectra, so the channel one. And you can see there are uh, many emission lines. Uh, the lines are uh, spe spectrally resolved. They have full with a maximum uh, larger than 250 kilometers per second, so we can measure the velocity dispersion and also try to model different velocity components. So uh, what we did to, uh, to analyze the, this uh, data cubes, uh, we, we created some line maps, uh, but since we are resolving the emission lines and the, and the profile of, of this Gaussian, what we did is uh, we integrated the, the emissions or the, the zero, zero moment map by integrating the emission uh, between plus minus 100, uh, so 1,100 kilometers per second. We also uh, calculate the velocity field using the first moment and the velocity dispersion from the second moment of the profile. Uh, then, so I will now focus on the, on the analysis of the emission in this uh, N2 radio hotspot. Uh, this is uh, the UV emission, so uh, this is the uh, this bright region here, which is also considered with the peak of the radio emission. It's also bright in the H alpha image and is, is located between these two uh, dust lines. So the, this N2 region is, is located there. So first of all, I want to I compare these uh, neon uh, maps from neon 2, which has a session potential of 32 UV, up to uh, neon 3, neon 5, and neon 6, which have a much higher ionization to 126 CV. And what we can see is that, for example, the neon 2 morphology is well, is similar to the H alpha morphology, although uh, the, the spatial resolution is lower. And then we see that as we increase the, the ionization, the strength is smaller. So neon 3 uh, peaks between the neon, uh, the N2 region and the N1. 
the uh, neon five is closer to the N one, and then the neon six is basically dominated by the well, the, the emission at the AGN and also at N one. So well, this uh, so this high ionization emission at, uh, at this N one location is not consistent with the, what we do expect in the Starbuck region. So it's, it's likely that this region, or it's unlikely that this region is produced or is produced by star formation, or the legitimation in this region is also produced by star formation. So, the, so that means that there is uh, no positive feedback in this region. And what is not clear is that the emission here is produced by soft waves related to the jet. This could be a possibility because it's, this is uh, along the jet axis, but also the AGN is relatively close. Uh, Few hundred parsecs, so it's possible that also there is a contribution from the AGN photoionization. There's possibly or is maybe an extended neural binding region that we can resolve and this is on mission here. Then uh, on the spatial resolution, I also wanted to mention that uh, well, the neon lines are very useful because, as I said, they can trace the, the status of the uh, of, of state of the gas with uh, no dependence on the abundance of, of the elements. But they are the uh, wavelengths, are, uh, they have relatively high uh, wavelengths. The shorter wavelength is the neon 6, that is at 7.6. But all the other lines are uh, the neon 2, for example, is at 13 micron, then the neon 3, 14, neon 3, 15. So the angular resolution that we have with MRS is, uh, well, is lower than what we can get if we, uh, we map the uh, shorter wavelength and lines. So instead, we can use some alternative tracers, for example, the argon-2 line. Argon-2 uh, also has a low ionization potential. And we can see that the morphology is also similar to what we have in neon-2. And it's also consistent with the HR finish. Possibly, these tracers are tracing the, the same uh, range. And we can do the same for the higher ionization. In this case, we can use a uh, of 5, which is at 5.6 micron. And uh, we see that the, the morphology that we have here is consistent with the neon 6. My possibility is to apply some deconvolution algorithm. We can do this because the, the PSF in space observation is quite stable and is relatively well known from the observation of calibration stars. And we applied uh, this well, the standard uh, Richardson Lucy uh, algorithm to the neon uh, six um, emission. We, we can increase by a factor of 1.5 or so the angular resolution. And we see that most of the emission is located here at the AGN, but also the, we can see, we can distinguish the emission from this N1 region here and also some emission uh, to the south of the AGN that is also seen in the magnesium file. So another interesting tracer that we have in the MRS range are the iron two lines. Uh, in particular, we focus on this uh, iron two line. This is the 5.3 micron because it's quite bright. And also, it, since this is short wavelength, the angular resolution is relatively well, it's quite good. So iron two lines are good, uh, a very good tracer of, uh, of soft regions. This is because. Iron plus has many lower excitation levels that are represented in this diagram here. So there are many uh, mid infrared lines, and also there are a number of near infrared lines that are dry. Uh, there are, well, here there are listed like six or seven uh, mid infrared lines. We detect most of them, not all of them. Well, some of them just are out of the shared range, and others because are too faint. Also, uh, this uh, iron, so iron has a low uh, ionization potential, it's only LTB. So, this uh, atom is quite easy to ionize by the EV radiation, it is produced uh, by the soap. Uh, also, uh, the last reason for these lines to be useful in socks is that uh, if the grains are destroyed by the, by the soap, um, by the soap wakes, then the iron abundance is highly enhanced. So is possible to, to have the, to be of on this on favors these lines to be very bright in, in this uh, region. So this is the the map that we obtain for this line, the 5.3. And as we can see, so the contours are again the radio emission. And we can see that the peak of the iron to emission, so is this shock uh, region, is at the well is consistent with the peak of the of the of this radio hotspot the N2. 
Uh, also, since we are detecting this ionized gas through the carbon line or the, or the iron, line, um, iron two lines, we want to uh, quantify the, the mass that is in this, in this region. We can use uh, relations like this one. So uh, we need the H-alpha luminosity and the electron density. There are no uh, many electron density diagnostics in the MRI range, but we can use this uh, ratio between these two iron two lines. This iron two lines ratio is represented here that has some dependence on temperature. The, the second line, this four eighty-nine micron iron two line, is very, is very faint, and we don't detect this line, but we have an upper limit on in this flux, which uh, we uh, define or we have this upper limit on the or lower limit in this ratio. And this is consistent with that uh, with this limit from the for the electron density. And well, we also uh, have, as I said, some recombination lines in this range. Uh, we can use the full alpha line at 7.46 micron. That assuming the case based recombination, we know that there is already oh, well, uh, this ratio between H alpha and, and, the, and the luminosity of the ratio. So using these two values, this luminosity and density and limit and density, we estimate that the mass of the ionized gas in this region in the hotspot is between two to 12 uh, times 10 to the five solar uh, masses. And we also have uh, molecular gas uh, lines in this range. Uh, it's been uh, shown that this, uh, these lines are uh, bright in, in soft regions and also in radio galaxies. Uh, since we know that this is a short region and also it's a radio jet, so we expect these lines to be bright. I saw here the map of two of the lines that are in this range. The S2, that is at 12.3 micron. This line traces warm H2 uh, with a temperature around uh, 300 Kelvin, that I will show uh, later uh, how this, this temperature is estimated. And we see that the emission from this low excitation line is. There is some emission, uh, and of course, coincident with this uh, dust lane. And also, there is some enhancement of the emission at the uh, end to location. But the contrast between the two is not extremely high. But instead, if we go to a higher uh, excitation H2 line, the S5, which is 6.8 micron, this one is of tracing a hot H2 uh, gas with a temperature of about 900 K. And in this case, we see a quite different morphology. We can still see some emission from the dust lane, but very faint. So in the dust lane, there is hot gas too. But it is much brighter at the, at the, at the interaction spot, so this uh, at the radio jet. So this uh, line, so this hot gas is possibly, or is possibly uh, is much uh, brighter at the, at the interaction spot the, of this uh, radio jet. So, well, as I, we, we have a number of uh, hydrogen lines in this spectral range from the S1 to the S8. So all these are H2 rotational lines. So we can uh, prepare this or so calculate this rotational diagram. In this diagram, if we observe a straight line like this one, that means that this is a single temperature. But instead of this, in this uh, in spectral line uh, SCB, uh, so we have like a positive curvature. So that means uh, that we have a temperature distribution. To model this curvature, we use a two component model, which has a warm or uh, which fit a warm component with a temperature about 300 K, is this uh, dot line here that basically dominates the emission from S1 and S2. And then we have another component at a temperature of about 900 K. That is the one that is the main emission from S3 up to S3, S6. And then these two higher excitation lines, the S8, they are not well reproduced by the model. So, uh, what well, is an evidence that there are there uh, is high, higher temperature uh, gas, molecular gas in this region, is temperature higher than 1000 K, but it's not possible to constrain, uh, to constrain this component only with these two lines. And possibly, we, we need to combine. Uh, the new reaffirmation with the uh, lines that are observed in the new spec range. So, uh, we can, uh, if we can now uh, uh, 
move back to these maps. So we see this is the, the dust, uh, dust lane and the low excitation, the H2. So now we know that according to this uh, diagram, this is dominated uh, by the warm dust, or the, this is the distribution of the warm dust, while the hot dust uh, basically peaks at this location. In addition, we can also estimate the, um, the mass of the, of the molecular gas. So for the warm component, the 300 component, we measure a mass of six uh, times 10 to the five solar masses, which is uh, compatible or similar to the mass of the ions uh, component. And for the hot gas, is is very low uh, compared to is ten percent of the warm gas. So in terms of mass, it's not very important, but it's uh, quite bright in terms of luminosity. So, or we can also estimate the mechanical energy in this hotspot because we can later compare this with the energy of the jet. To estimate the mechanical energy, we can use this equation which is the, the mass and the, <coughs> and the velocity dispersion. Now for the velocity dispersion, I wanted to show this uh, part of the, of the MRS uh, spectrum because it shows uh, very close in wavelength the emission from H2 and argon 2 so the spectral resolution is similar. So what we see here is that the ionized gas uh, line is much broader than the, than the emission from the H2. So the ionized ha gas has a velocity dispersion uh, higher than 300 km per second. Why all the hydrogen lines have uh, half this uh, expression, 150 km per second. And this is observed for all the H2 lines. And this difference between the ionized gas velocity uh, expression and the, um, and the H2 velocity expression was already observed in the Spitzer uh, spectra of radio galaxies. So, well, so from these values, we can estimate the, the mechanical energy that is located at this uh, hotspot. So from the energy in the ionized gas is in this range, 0.6 to 3.2 times the 44x, which is higher, so it dominates the mechanical energy. So it is always higher than the energy that is in the one, uh, in the one component. Um, we can also compare the velocity dispersion to try to understand how these lines are produced. So the argon two, uh, this uh, argon two emission is from ionized gas. So the velocity dispersion here is this has this value 300 to 100 uh, kilometers per second. So it's, it's much higher than the than the velocity dispersion in the environment, but it's uh, possibly enhanced or by the gas that is compressed by the shock front. But instead, if we look at the the velocity dispersion of the H two, we see that is not particularly higher than the velocity dispersion in other regions of the galaxies, even lower than other regions. So it's possible that the H2 emission is not, is not produced by the, by, by the gas that is already affected by the shock, but instead it would be connected to the gas uh, pre or the pre soft gas. So, uh, well, I also want to briefly mention this, uh, this other hotspot, the one located to the south. Uh, this for this galaxy for this hotspot, sorry, we only have uh, the channel three and channel four data, so we have information between these uh, two wavelengths. That means that we only have lower spatial resolution data, less lines available. But well, this is from HST and NIRCAM. So from the images, we see in the UV an uh, arc like a structure that is also seen in itself and also in here in the NIRCAM image. But for example, or it's a difference compared to the north uh, hotspot, we don't see any dust plane uh, around this region. Uh, we can also um, compare the, the radio emission with the energy from, from the neon line, from the ionized gas in the UV range. So we have the neon 2, neon 3, neon 5. So there is a shift between the peak of the neon 2, neon 3, and also neon 5. Well, neon 5 maybe is closer to the peak of the radio. So, uh, how to explain this emission? So possibly this could be a combination of the shock emission with the jet, but also could be extended in a large. And uh, on the on the molecular gas, uh, we only have uh, the map from the low excitation H2 line, the S2. Uh, we don't see any uh, enhancement or bright emission at this location. But it's also true that this line is, is, is painted, you know, as we saw before, is painted in the in the soap um, regions compared to the, for example, the S5. But the S5 is not observed. So 
it, it doesn't look like the, there's a lot of molecular gas here, but you cannot say because we don't have the, the line that is better to trace this uh, soft gas. So now uh, I wanted also to, to mention briefly some uh, models that can explain the mission that we have. So uh, this is a fast uh, shock model. In this model, there is a uh, five kilometer per second shock that is moving to the, in this direction, to the left. So the gas that is located uh, at this side, this is uh, precursor of this shock gas. So this is the, the shock form. And then to the right is the shock gas. So in these high velocity uh, uh, shocks, the, the gas after the shock form which is very high temperature, in this example, between 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 K. This gas uh, produces high emission lines, it's in position in equilibrium, and it also produces the extreme UV uh, emission spectra that is represented here, which uh, depends also on the velocity, so the hardness of this ionization uh, radiation depends on the, on the velocity of the shock. And also it's interesting because this power, this power law Spectrum maybe is well, it's not always easy to distinguish the emission from a fast uh, shock with the emission from uh, the from an ABM. And also, since we have this ionizing uh, variation, this variation can ionize the gas uh, before the shock. So, this particular emission, we can see here the H1 fraction and the H2. So, we see that there is uh, H2 dominated or so ionized uh, gas uh, in front of the shock. This uh, also, this uh, radiation also ionizes the shock gas. So in this region here, once the gas cools down, it also dominated. So part of the gas uh, of the hydrogen combines, but then is again ionized by this, uh, or is similar to an H2 region instead of the ionization. And then after the this photo ion region, then the, the hydrogen decombines and it becomes again atomic. And um, well, some limitation of these sub models is that the H2 emission is not included. So it's, this is basically a sub uh, form that is impacting some uh, atomic uh, gas. So um, the H2 emission that we see could be located here in the pre sub uh, gas. Uh, so, if we have a H2 emission here, the, this radiation field can hit, or the UV radiation that is not absorbed or absorbed by hydrogen, can hit the molecular gas and produce the emission that we see. Or it could be a molecular gas that is located here after the shock. So, after the gas uh, becomes atomic, it can also reform H2 molecules. So, we could have H2 emission here or here. But since uh, we uh, know or we found that the velocity dispersion of the H2 emission is uh, quite lower, it's much lower than the velocity dispersion of the ionized gas that we produce in this uh, shock region, it's likely that the emission that we see from H2 is from the T uh, shock gas, because otherwise we possibly expect a much higher ionization or much higher uh, turbulence similar to the turbulence that we see in, in the ionized gas. And now we can also compare this uh, prediction from these models with the ratio that we, uh, we observed in the, in the different regions in the galaxy, the AGM, the N2, and the S2 uh, hotspots. So these are the neon 5, neon 2, neon 3, to neon 2 ratios. So we plot here the AGM. So this is the, the, the ratio from the AGM are consistent with the ratio that are observed in the sister galaxies. So this is consistent with the photo ionized in our line uh, emission. The N2, uh, it's uh, neon 5 is not detected, so it's uh, weak compared to the ratios that are found in AGM. So this point here it could be compatible with a uh, soft uh, models that are represented by this uh, grid here. And uh, finally, this region, this S2, has a strong uh, neon 5 and neon 3 compared to the neon 2 emission. Is, is bright, this is brighter than what is expected by uh, soft models. Uh, so, this is located as we saw before at 1.5 kiloparsecs. So, this could be a combination of narrow, narrow line uh, region emission for the ionized by the GM, but also this is located close to the jet. So, maybe. This is a combination uh, from both, from the shocks and also from the photoionization from the AGM. 
but possibly we will need or we will need the also the, the other lines in the shorter uh, wavelength the range of, of medium. Um, also, as, as we can saw before, uh, we can uh, calculate the mechanical energy that is in the N2 radio hotspot. Now, thanks to the MRS observations, we can say that the mission that we see is compatible with the shock origin. We also uh, saw that that region there are dust lanes and some enhanced H2 uh, emission, which is consistent with this interaction between the radio jet and the molecular ISM at that uh, location. And also, uh, this uh, the asymmetry in the jet uh, length is consistent with this interaction between the jet and the ISM, molecular ISM, uh, which is able to this, uh, the, the jet will transfer its energy to the ISM. So from the from the radio emission from the 1.4 gigahertz, we can estimate the, the total power of the jet. There are some uh, correlations. So we estimate that this is the, the power of the jet. We can also estimate under some assumptions the age of the jet, and we find that the jet energy is about, uh, is about this number that we can compare with the mechanical energy that we detect in these uh, two cases. So we find that the mechanical energy uh, in the ionized and one phase is less than 1% of the jet energy. However, according to simulation, we expect that these uh, low energy jets. That, uh, are, uh, well, that are interacting with the ISMs uh, should, or, well, uh, according to simulation, they should uh, deposit about 25 to 30 percent of the energy as mechanical energy in the ISM. But we, we, or, but what we find is much in a much lower fraction. So there are some alternatives that we uh, propose here. So it's possible that the, the score molecular phase that we are not detecting is uh, the H2 lines. So we have this positive curvature, which I mentioned before. So it's possible that there are also colder gas that is not detected by this H2 line. So instead, we may need a CO observations that could uh, call in part or a significant fraction of this mechanical energy of the jet. It's also possible that there are outflows uh, that also using part of this kinetic energy, although we are not uh, detecting uh, strong outflows in the, in, in the phases that we see uh, in this meeting. Maybe there's a cold molecular uh, gas outflow in CO, but we don't have the data yet. Another alternative is that, um, well, it's, it's, it's seen that H2 is a very efficient uh, cooling uh, gas in salt. So it's possible that the jet uh, actually transferred this uh, large fraction of its energy to the ISM. But it's already uh, released or emitted as H2 emission. So, for, and for that reason, we only are able to see this uh, small fraction of the mechanical energy. But in any case, this is an open question, and we uh, would need more observation to understand how this uh, interaction between the ISM and the jet is, well, how this uh, is, uh, how the jet is, is affecting the, the ISM in this galaxy in the, in the molecular phase. So, well, so this is the last slide, this is just the summary. And I think I can stop here. Um, well, thank you for your attention. Um, I'll let you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Miguel. It was a really fascinating talk. Do we have questions? Happy to, to read questions out in chat or go ahead and unmute, raise your hand. I saw this one hand from Hane. Go ahead and unmute. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Miguel. Very nice talk and very interesting uh, results. I was curious about, um, so N1 and N2, I think now Mary told us it's not likely to be positive feedback, but uh, it's more likely, especially N2 is shock ionized. Okay, mm -hmm. so, and, but, in, I'm just curious about kin kinematics because at the beginning it showed us about H alpha being blue shifted. And I wonder mm -hmm. if you also saw this in MIRI data with, for example, N2, NEON2 or other recomb yeah. recombination lines. Yeah, so I, I have also prepared this slide. Uh, so this is the, the kinematic of the oxygen free, so this blue shifted and blue shifted. And this is what we see uh, with the argon two lines. So this is the NOx gas. And well, it's not. 
the kinematic is not that clear. So we have a red shifted mission here, blue shifted here, blue shifted here, and also red shifted here. So it's not as clear as the large scale oxygen three and H alpha. So possibly, or maybe, the outflow is not yet launched uh, so close to the AGN and, and it's launched a bit further. Also, there is a limitation with this first moment map. So this is uh, so this is the, so, so this is a first moment map. So uh, if the profile has multiple components, we all, uh, we only see uh, one of them or the, like the mean value here. So to do a proper analysis of the kinematics, uh, we need to to to, well, to to model the different components or the broad profiles and try to see if we are able to well, maybe distinguish this entangle the emission from the outflow from the emission that is not in the outflow. But well, in, in any case, the, the kinematic that we see is not consistent with the outflow that is observed in the large scale data. Because well, this is many, right? This is, this is like 20 seconds or so, and here, here we have two R seconds. So there is a quite large difference in scale in these two maps. I see. Thank you. Interesting. Any other questions? I have a question for you, Miguel. Other people are are contemplating their questions. Um, you had mentioned that there was near spec data available. What kind mm -hmm. of insight do you anticipate might be available from those data that can can those data help address the, this big question of where the missing energy is has gone? Yeah. So, well, uh, I think one of the one of the interesting. Uh, Lines that are in that range are the uh, hydrogen two lines. So, in the near infrared range, there are a number of uh, well, the rotational uh, the lines with higher J, but also the low vibrational lines. So, it would be possible to uh, trace the complete the temperature distribution of the molecular gas here, which will also help to constrain the, the soft model. And because so far, I think there are no uh, soft models or, or fast soft models which include. Uh, the H2 emission. So I think having the temperature distribution of the H2 will help to constrain this kind of model. And also in the near infrared, there are uh, some uh, iron two lines, and uh, which uh, together with the lines that we have here in the, in the mid infrared can be used to constrain the temperature and the density of the gas. Because well, we are constraining the density, but uh, only with an upper limit with a line that not, that not is detected. But if we have the near infrared, uh, Iron to light, we can much better constrain the dense the electron density and the temperature in these in these regions. Fantastic. As well as the stellar kinematics, because also in the, in the in that region we have these CO1 heads that can be used to trace the stellar kinematic at this scale. And this also will help to interpret all the well, all the emission that we see here. So can I ask, are you planning to to investigate these things with the near spec data, or is there somebody else who's who's taking yeah. that on that you know? No, so so I'm not working on the data. Um, but, well, we download the data, but there was some calibration problems that maybe are not are not solved. But yes, I'm sure that the the there are some lines detected, but we have never uh, go much in detail because of this calibration. But I'm sure it will be quite interesting to to see this, uh, these lines of these uh, events uh, presented and published in the paper. So I'll look forward to seeing that. Do we have any other questions? Oh, Dana. Okay, hello. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you for the talk. Very nice data. I just want to mention the following, just on that image that you have on the screen, mm -hmm. it looks to me very much that the first spot that you call N1 um, and in other images, it looks very much like a bulb shock. So that is why you were expect mm -hmm. for the impact of the jet. Um, on top of that, you see these very high initiation lines. And these very high initiation lines to be produced, I, I guess the photonization by the nucleus might apply, of course, because you cannot switch off the nucleus, the photonization. But at such a distance of one and a half kiloparsec, uh, to produce such a high initiation lines, 
uh, I don't see much more than fundamentally or essentially shocks. So, um, because otherwise it's very hard to make them. Um, so um, I think you could check, for example, the models that Sueli, Viegas, and um, Contini had mm -hmm. published, where they publish all the line ratios you would expect from shocks and photonization. It's a, a paper in 2001, and you will see from different velocities, you will see how excitation mm -hmm. you might expect there. Mm -hmm. but, but to me, it looks like it has to, well, it looks very much like shocks. And then I will use more the neon phi lines or neon six even to estimate the kinetic power mm -hmm. of the jet. Uh, nonetheless, I think you lose a lot of power in the way too, because it's a bit far away. So it's normal that you see a difference, I would say. We see in other cases as well. As you go farther out, the jet has already released a lot of the power by shocking the medium. So one and a half kiloparsec away, it's a bit far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I completely agree that this uh, looks like this bow shock are possibly related to the jet. We did some numbers to see if the luminosity from the AGM could ionize this region. Of is well depends on the luminosity that we assume, but it's possible that it's contributing a bit. But it's true that it, this for the morphology, I say that this is uh, connected to the to the jet and it's a kind of bow shock. So yes, I completely agree. And yes, I think it, com the comparison with the models uh, would be quite useful to well, confirm that this is possibly the the shock emission. Thanks. We had one more question from Violetta. Uh, do you have any clues on the kind of dust that is causing the SI feature? The kind of uh, dust. Yeah, so it's it's in the chat if you want to see it oh. uh, yourself. Yeah. But but it's the the kind of dust causing the silicon feature absorption. I see. Ah, okay. Yes. Uh, so, well, I, I don't know exactly. So, in principle, you have silicates in, in the in dust in general. So, we only detect the, the silicate uh, absorption in the AGN. Let me go back um, here. So, we only see this, uh, this silicate feature in the spectrum of the AGN. And this is because we also need, or to detect this absorption, we need a strong uh, continuum. Uh, so, in the AGN, we have emission from the torus. So, this is one dust. And we are able to detect this. So this is from silicate that are in the dust grain. In the other regions, the dust emission is from a colder gas. So there is almost no dust emission at 10 micron uh, beyond the AGN. And the dust emission, uh, in the, for example, in two, starts uh, to be uh, detected maybe at 15, 20 micron. And here, uh, yeah, it's not possible to detect the this absorption because well, it's, uh, at this point it's not detected the, the continuum. Great, thanks. Shopita. Um, very nice talk, Miguel, and a lot of very interesting uh, detailed analysis. I, I have a um, quick question about extinction mm -hmm. and uh, how significant it is. Uh, at these wavelengths, is it something that you can ignore? And the other thing is, like, I noticed the neon six line compared to the neon five, it seems uh, brighter than other, uh, the few other galaxies in which that line was detected. And I wondered if the ratios are very different from other AGNs. Yeah, so the, for the neon six, uh, we have not compared uh, <clears throat> the ratio of this line with other AGMs. <clears throat> Basically, uh, because neon six was uh, not uh, detected or was not observed with uh, Spitzer, or were not detected in many AGMs, so we don't have many detections. So, uh, but yeah, this is something that we uh, like to compare with neon six and neon five. Um, in terms of extinction, uh, in principle, uh, this galaxy uh, doesn't have large amounts of dust. So I think it's relatively safe to uh, consider that the, the mean fatal range is uh, not very affected by extinction. So maybe we are losing 
20% or 30% of the flux, but it's not like in the optical that uh, this is, for example. So this is this is interesting because, for example, in H alpha in the optical, the the south part of the, of the or to the south of the AGN is absorbed by this uh, dust, which is also seen in the UV. But then this is detected, for example, in neon five and also in the argon lines. So uh, I think the extinction in this galaxy that is not very dusty. I mean, also as we saw, the amount of molecular gas from CO is not particularly high in the central region. Is not very important. So the extinction is not very important in the medium channel. We we compare uh, with well, we measure the ratio of the recombination lines, uh, the hydrogen recombination lines that are in this range, and we were not able to to constrain the, the extinction using the, the lines that we observed with the MLS. Great, thanks, Miguel. Any other last questions? All right, I know Miguel had offered to join um, the student session after this. If Jeffrey, are you going to be holding? Uh, there's no session? student session today, actually. Okay, no student session today, so yep. we will. Um, I sent Miguel an invite to the Discord, though, so we can chat offline yeah. there. Great, fantastic. Thank you, Miguel, for taking the time to do that. Um, then I guess we will um, thank Miguel for a wonderful um, presentation and really interesting results that you've shared. And should we to correct me if I'm wrong, our next uh, seminar series, December 13th, is that right? When Enrique. Lopez Rodriguez is going to be presenting. Not correcting me, so I'm assuming that's correct. <laughs> Any other um, announcements you want to make before we, we part for the day? I don't think so, except everyone have a wonderful and restful Thanksgiving. I don't, I don't know yes. All right. Thanks again, Miguel, and it was great to see everybody. See you guys next time. Thanks, everyone.